Welcome everybody to the American Space Museum. I'm Mark Marquette and we're so glad you're with us to stay curious today with the voice of NASA, Mr. Hugh Harris. Welcome, Hugh. Oh, thank you. We're always glad to have you here. How are you doing today? Well, pretty good other than I was, we have so much to talk about in this particular podcast that uh, I ran out of time to actually drive up to get here. <laughs> well, it is a busy June of shuttles, and we're going to uh, uh, talk about the shuttles of, of uh, June. And we're going to move the microphone a little bit closer there to you, Hugh. There, that might work good there. And we wanted to point out that that's a statue of Sally Ride. It's in progress, going to be revealed, uh, I think, next month. Uh, a uh, beautiful sculpture of her, and, and he will tell us why she is our star of our podcast today. But for those of you who don't know Mr. Hugh Harris, he was the voice of NASA, providing countdown commentary for the brave new era of the space shuttle program <laughs> during your illustrious career. Uh, millions of people around the world heard Mr. Harris confirm the liftoff. Uh, and the victorious debut of Columbia, and of course you dealt with the tragic losses of Challenger and the fight back of Discovery's first return to flight. Uh, and we're so pleased that Mr. Harris is involved with the American Space Museum and our uh, Stay Curious video podcast, which Marty Winkle, my cameraman, co-producer for two years. Hugh, we've done almost 600 episodes of keeping people curious out there. And we're well, so pleased that you're a a, a, a part of it now. Well, I think that's incredible. That is a lot of podcasts. Yeah, it is. <laughs> it is. It's a lot of trying to think of something every day and, to and, talk about. But you know, there is something every day to talk about in our, well, in our brilliant is. American space program. And that's why we feel our program's even getting more popular as we celebrate shuttles of June and every month and learn a lot about them, just like you and I have research in them. Well, and, and I think that it's very appropriate that you've moved your studio. I don't know whether you talked about that previously, uh, but the uh, it's in the what used to be the Hubble part of the museum. And uh, the Hubble, uh, you know, made some of its greatest discoveries involving dark matter in the universe. So I don't know how that affects your podcast, but the, uh, Well, some of my stuff definitely comes from dark matter <laughs> or material, or, or, but uh, on the dark side of the moon, sometimes we got a little moon news to, to uh, come up with before we turn Mr. Harris loose on our shuttles of June. We love, there's 11 shuttles of June. Hugh, it's a very interesting month. We'll, uh, with uh, 25, almost 25% 25 of the, the flyers were women in this month. And as we go through shuttles of the month with Hugh and, and I continue them throughout the uh, every month, we're, you know, to me, it's fascinating to learn things that are juxtaposed in the same month and so forth. And we have some of that going on this month. Uh, but uh, we're glad that you're here in good health. And uh, we have a, oh, we wanted to show a few pictures of you to some good old school pictures oh. of you there. There's one of you uh, maybe talking to a launch director or um, uh, don't know exactly when well, that was. I, you got a mustache there, so that might date you a little bit. Well, it, it, I grew that for a, uh, a play I was in. I was in the theater a lot in Cleveland. Uh -huh. And I kept it when I moved down here in 75 from the Lewis Research Center. And uh, so it was after 75, <laughs> and it probably, it was one of the early uh, shuttles. Well, of course, you did start your career at in Cleveland, uh, <clears throat> a Buckeye like myself, and uh, 25 Ohio knots we can be proud about. Uh, but how, tell us how many years you're coming up on being permanently badged for NASA. Oh, well, since 63, so I'm coming up on 50 years. 60 years next year. Well, 60 yeah, 60 right. years next year. You said you're going to keep that badge until you get so in there. Fast. Time does <laughs> go by fast. Here's another time warp picture of you in your office in the Launch Control Center. Don't know who you're talking to there. That's George Diller. Okay. And, and George, you know, people talk about me being the voice of shuttle launch control. He he did 
more launches than I did of uh, space shuttles. And uh, I was very pleased when I uh, uh, hired him. He had been uh, working uh, in radio uh, and television, I think, in Tampa. Mm -hmm. And uh, George Diller. Had a great voice. And uh, uh, was just perfect in that. And uh, I always tried to rotate people so that there wasn't just one voice. <laughs> mm -hmm. Well, good. And, and we've all that watched the launches, uh, you know, have enjoyed all of that. Uh, and being a news person, though, sort of a double-edged sword, as I know from my experiences, you kind of, you're like insurance sometimes, a necessary evil that has to mm -hmm. be there because we've talked about, oh, the great launch director, George Page, the first four launches and so forth. Some of those, 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 those NASA people really didn't care too much about the media there, right? And just uh, gave you what you need to know. Well, that's true. And uh, George Page uh, didn't want me talking to anybody in the firing room uh, about what might be happening. Uh, so if anything went wrong, which did happen on STS-1, uh, I wasn't allowed to ask anybody about oh, really? that. What went so, wrong on STS-1? Well, there was a problem with the computers getting out of sync, mm -hmm. and uh, the uh, launch was scrubbed, and uh, then we went, I think, the next day. Right, April but, 12, uh, 1981. So I, I had to pick up a phone, and uh, I had a list of numbers I could call the people outside the firing room uh, to get help with finding out what was going on. Well, as we progress along with Stay Curious and have Mr. Harris in our fold here, we're going to talk about some of the notable reporters of the day. Everybody knows Walter Cronkite and Jules Bergman, and uh, uh, but uh, there's some others out there that you and I had a phone conversation, and we're looking forward to putting some programs together for you to stay curious about some of the lesser-known and more colorful so, uh, media people out there. Well, and there's a, a lot of colorful media people, <laughs> and uh, uh, but also uh, uh, some of the colorful media people are women, and they did a great job, uh, and uh, sometimes under difficult circumstances, not, not from us, because mm -hmm. NASA welcomed them uh, just like any other reporter, uh, but they were not always uh, welcomed by the other reporters. Mm -hmm. I hear you. There, that, that's a lot of. And we're gonna. So we're teasing you. We got some shows in the works here with Mr. Harris about some, some wonderful. And you're talking like Mary Bubb is one of those women oh, involved yeah. in there, uh, notorious for wearing her hats, I guess. And well, she and, always uh, had a different hat for each launch. And uh, so you're gonna learn about who Mary Bubb is one day from Hugh Harris here. But Hugh, a couple, you know, we love space history, and we got a little few items on June 10th uh, for housekeeping here. And one is this amazing photograph in 1966, one of the first photographs from an alien world that is a landing pad of Surveyor 1 on the moon. And then it took a, pa uh, a panorama uh, with its shadow in the background. Most of you all know it looks like a spidery, three-legged uh, spacecraft. Uh, and it was launched uh, just 10 miles from where we're sitting here in our Stay Curious studios over on uh, launch pad uh, 14, uh, 36. Yeah, right. it was launched from pad 36 with an Atlas Centaur rocket. Uh, and uh, it was launched on May 30th, 1966, landed June 2nd. This was a big deal. It was. I was here. And the, uh, sure. the Lewis Research Center was in charge of Atlas Centaurs, and that was the uh, reason I was able to come down and, uh, and work that launch. And uh, what I'm really uh, happy about is that that's one of the few uh, pads uh, that is still active and hasn't been uh, destroyed or mm -hmm. lost to rust and that sort of corrosion. Actually, when you go out to Cape Canaveral mm -hmm. Beach or Port Canaveral, you can see the largest water tank uh, around. I don't know if it's the world. Jeff Bezos has leased uh, Pad 36 for Blue Origin and his new Glenn rocket. It's over 300 feet tall. That, that's going to eclipse that 222-foot 
uh, Falcon 9, and when they start launching that 18 foot in diameter new Glenn, it's a behemoth for sure. Mm -hmm. And you can see that structure on the pad there. So uh, we're looking forward to that. But sur uh, Surveyor 1, uh, you know, uh, we didn't know uh, if uh, the moon you, was 10 feet of dust or brittle, that, it, that something would crash That's through the right. surface. So when it landed, this was a really big deal, though the Russians landed a probe Luna 9 before us, it basically bounced around and then landed like a mm -hmm. like a ball, and uh, so this was a true soft landing on an alien world. Well, it, it also was a, uh, a a precursor of how do you design a landing with people in it, mm -hmm. because if it had sunk into the the dust as you mentioned, uh, you know, it had to have a whole different way of sending people to the moon absolutely that's why this was such an important picture to see how much it dug into the lunar surface right uh and there's a color chart wheel there uh to gauge uh textures and stuff like that on there but you know this was launched from pad 36 we were talking about and we're so proud of our cape canaveral gallery that recreates one of the launch complexes out there with with uh, uh consoles from 36 and 14 and and 19 and there's a flag that we fr we proudly fly that was in launch control 36 uh, back in the day you see surveyor up there in the upper left hand corner that's the surveyor spacecraft uh, i always say like uh, scouting or other things they had such pride in their craft they had a flag hanging in the middle of their launch control room there mm -hmm. and we have that flag in our gallery now that that uh, and mariner went to mars and, v and pioneer to venus so I wanted to throw that in about our our uh, uh, gallery here. And we another thing, Hugh, we want to wish a happy birthday to this man, Mark Lewis Polanski. Happy 66th birthday to you, sir, born in Patterson, New Jersey, former space shuttle commander, spent 42 days in space. He was in the later uh, ones, uh, 98 and, nine, and 116, he was a pilot, and then he was commander of 127, and there he is out on, in the white room with uh, what Triple T tells us all the time, these little plaques that were made made there. And uh, I love this picture of him making dinner uh, or lunch for, he apparently had lunch duty there. That's uh, He's got hot dogs on tortillas with mustard and stuff <laughs> on there, uh, on the clips on there, magnetic clips. That's how you eat in space, folks. And uh they found that flour and corn tortillas was the best way because they couldn't use bread right. because of the uh, particles. Problems. Yeah, <laughs> they might get behind something, right? Uh, anyway, Polanski, happy birthday to you, uh, 66 years old. Uh, he, uh, uh, Peggy Whitson, chief of the astronaut office and, and the most experienced women astronaut American, said Mark is a remarkable, talented individual, his skills in aviator, coupled with his engineering expertise were a valuable contribution to our team. We wish him well in his future endeavors. So uh, he was nicknamed Roman because the famous film director Roman Polanski shared the last name with him. So, And one other space history thing to talk about, our shuttles of the month of June. We're kicking off a launch today. STS-91 D is up there for Discovery was launched with uh, uh, six people on board, uh, one, two, three, four, five, six, including the Russian, most, one, very experienced Russian, uh, Valerie Rum Rumian. There's the launch of a beautiful uh, uh, 6.06 p.m. launch of Pad 39A on June 2nd, uh, 1998. This was headed to the Mir space station for the last time, last of nine encounters with the Mir, uh, the ninth docking and crew exchange, and here is the crew. Two women were on board there, uh, Janet Cavandi and Wendy Lawrence. Now, Hugh, of our 68 astronauts launched on uh, shuttles in the month of May, uh, 15 of them were women. So 22% uh, of, of the crews launched in the month of June in America were women. And we'll see if that's the most ratio uh, it, I know it's going to be pretty close to it, uh, but uh, uh, 
uh, 11 shuttles, 68 crew members, 15 of them were women, and two of those women flew together in space. Uh, that would be uh, 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 Eileen Baker and Bonnie Dunbar. They flew together on the Mir mission, this one here, and then uh, uh, three years earlier, they flew on STS-50, a micro lab. Uh, a micro, uh, lab. Uh, so I'd love to talk to either one of them about them flying together mm. three years apart on, on and training together for those missions. I think that's very interesting. Do you remember any public relations on that that went through your office? Well, <laughs> theoretically, it all came through my office uh, one way or another, but uh, the astronauts really uh, had most of their uh, visits with the press in Houston uh, because they were based there in the uh, at the Johnson Space Center. Right. But uh, when they were here, uh, then we certainly set up press conferences and uh, escorted them in the press to uh, talk to them. Well, this is, of course, the mission that uh, uh, Travis Thompson, astronaut uh, closeout crew lead, Triple T, says that uh, about four gallons of vodka got smuggled onto the the uh, on a, uh, Discovery was was the spaceship and through the White Room with Rumian coming up there. Very experienced astronaut. He was he was the uh, over the Salyut programs was mm -hmm. on Salyut six for a while, uh, and then I he he kind of punched his own ticket because he wanted to see the Mir the Mir space station. He'd never been on board, hmm. but he was the director of it. Right. So he kind of says, I want to go up there on my last flight and check it out. So he's also married to a cosmonaut, Condova, uh, mm -hmm. on there. So, uh, all right. Any, any, you didn't know about that vodka at the time, did you? Well, it seems you, like hardly enough. <laughs> <laughs> Four gallons is hardly enough. <laughs> All right. Well, we're going to get to the meat of our program here with Mr. Hugh Harris. And uh, we're going to, that's a picture of Sally Wright, of course, our U.S. postage stamp. And because we're going to talk a little bit about her mission, but kick it off, Hugh. What what uh, what did you come up with this month? Well, the um, obviously, she's probably the, uh, the most interesting of the uh, of the missions. And it was funny that you mentioned uh, uh, the number 22 because nobody at the beginning of the space program, when Alan Shepard went up, could imagine that it would be 22 years until a woman, American woman, uh, flew in space. And um, that, of course, turned out to be Sally Ride mm -hmm. on STS-7. Uh, back on June 18th of 1983. And you, you can't really talk about uh, STS-7 uh, without acknowledging her, but the, uh, uh, you know, there were uh, a dozen women who actually had trained prior to the first Mercury flights uh, that had hopes uh, that one of them might be chosen to go up on Mercury. So um, uh, it took a long time, but uh, it certainly proved themselves uh, once they got up there. And I don't think there's going to be a time now when there's not as many or more of them possibly on various missions. And um, Two women on the space station right now, Jessica Watkins, right. an Artemis astronaut, and uh, Samantha Cristoforetti and ESA astronaut are on the space mm -hmm. station right now. So you're right. There's always a female presence. We hope it's, it stays that way. The, well, uh, talking about STS-7, I know it wasn't the, uh, the first uh, uh, shuttle in May or in June. It wasn't in May either. <laughs> uh, but it was on June 18th in 1983. And... Uh, on board uh, uh, were uh, three, uh, uh, two communications satellites, uh, ANIC-2 for Telesat of Canada and Palapa B-1 for Indonesia. And uh, also the uh, 
a shuttle pallet satellite called SPAS, uh, one which was built in Germany and carried experiments that could be uh, done either in the cargo bay or if it was released, uh, which wasn't definite uh, originally, uh, it could be done while it was uh, in orbit. But let me mention the crew, uh, which was Bob Crippen, who of course was one of the uh, center directors here in later years, uh, Fred Hauck, uh, mission specialist John Fabian and Norm Thaggard, and of course Sally Ride. And I mention them in that order because Sally Ride uh, was wanted to, uh, did not want to take the spotlight uh, from any of the men or from anybody else for that matter. And she insisted um, wherever it was possible that the entire crew be together, even though after the flight, uh, she was in tremendous demand, uh, both by the media, by television, in conferences, and uh, all over the world. But um, she was very humble uh, about the, uh, the whole thing. And, um, but in addition to being the first American woman, uh, she was the youngest American woman uh, to fly at that particular time. And um, the- At age 32. Yeah. And still is the youngest American to fly at age 32. And um, I'm, um, I, I don't want to say that she is the smartest astronaut we ever had because all of them are pretty smart. <laughs> but she's certainly one of the smartest astronauts. And, um, not because of the things that she did as an astronaut, but also as her studies and capability uh, in the field of science and physics. And um, the work that she did um, was uh, uh, very esoteric as far as uh, uh, most people are concerned because it had to do with uh, uh, non-linear uh, movement of photons hmm. uh, and um, also of radiation. And um, the, uh, she specialized in astrophysics uh, and in free electron lasers. Uh, and her doctoral dissertation was the, on the interaction of X-rays with the interstellar medium. So it, it fit right in with the experiments uh, uh, that were done and from a lot of the uh, spacecraft that have been studying the interstellar medium. But um, her work on the uh, nonlinear photons hmm. really build on uh, uh, theories that uh, Einstein had had. We'll be talking more about Sally Ride uh, on that launch, but Hugh, I wanted to mention uh, that uh, uh, your role was uh, you were an assistant uh, in the uh, public uh, affairs office there, and uh, but the commander of this mission promoted you to do to to the uh, to the, the manager or director, whatever y'all called it right. there. Uh, I think that's kind of a neat tie. Uh, but what was your role with this uh, launch in 1983? Well, it, it was, um, when I say the standard things, uh, the, uh, I always felt that the role of public affairs uh, was to bring people into the center, into what was happening, and into the information uh, about what it all meant. Uh, not to keep people out. Uh, so the, uh, uh, so I spent most of my time making sure that uh, we kept up to uh, speed, gave the, uh, the news media what they needed to do their stories, mm -hmm. and uh, provided the uh, public with as much uh, uh, access uh, as uh, it was possible to, uh, to do. And I might say the uh, this isn't happening anymore, 
and I don't know whether it'll happen again, uh, but we had more than 80,000 uh, people on the center frequently uh, for watching uh, some of the launches. Wow, 80, and this was a huge uh, launch, of course. There's Sally. Later years, we're so proud at the American Space Museum that we have the handprints of Sally Ride, uh, just as well-worn as Neil Armstrong's are over there in our Apollo gallery. Mm -hmm. Her actual handprints there, uh, taken uh, uh, about the year 2002, somewhere in there. Unfortunately, she passed away from cancer 10 years ago, yep. uh, Hugh. And uh, uh, when you're on the cover of Time or Newsweek, you are famous. And uh, those are the stories that, like Hugh talked about, I hear about this wonderful lady. She was a very petite lady, by the way. Yes, she was. Uh, she was tiny mm -hmm. and, uh, uh, but, and smart and... Uh, uh, knew I, I, she just had a way about her, I guess. I never got to meet her, but uh, to handle all this pressure and kind of, well, there's five other women behind me that are going to fly, and I've got these other four crewmates that went mm -hmm. with me. It's not all me. Extraordinary person. Well, you're, you're absolutely right. And the um, uh, one of the things that uh, uh, people don't realize is that she was a... Uh, a world-class athlete too, uh, mm. in, in addition to her academic uh, laurels. Um, she started uh, playing tennis uh, when she was, uh, I think, 10 years old. Mm. And by the uh, time she was 12 years old, uh, she was ranked in the uh, top uh, 20 of her age group uh, in California. Uh, later on, uh, she went on to uh, be rated number one at Stanford when she continued her academic career. Hmm. And they, um, uh, and for some time, she worked on becoming a professional tennis player. So her, her interests were very varied. And, um, and I was talking to somebody the other day, and I mentioned that knowing somebody like Sally Ride and um, uh, the, well, and, and the other uh, astronauts, uh, because I think it, it really is uh, ubiquitous across the spectrum, is that maybe what I didn't know was that as part of the uh, uh, process in picking uh, astronauts, was to give them a niceness test. A niceness <laughs> test, okay. Because you find a lot of, uh, I, 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 it, I, not every astronaut is nice all of the time, <laughs> but <laughs> by and large, they're a pretty nice group. Well, and they know that you're part of the media and, and want to put them into good light too. So we'll revisit Sally Wright around the June 18th launch of STS-7. Uh, but, uh, and we want to, uh, so enjoy that as your, of course, the, uh, like I said, the sculpture behind me is part of, uh, uh, a new uh, tribute to her. San Diego, uh, Science Museum, San Diego has the Sally Wright Science Museum that I understand is a fabulous place that I'd like to go to mm -hmm. someday. So, Hugh, let's talk a little bit about some of the other shuttles of June that I put up the, the, uh, our, our uh, display of up there. Well, one of, one of the uh, things you might, we might mention, and you might have done this in another podcast, uh, but t tomorrow is the uh, anniversary of the first U.S. spacewalk uh, with Ed White. Uh, good one. Yes, you good. No, we don't talk uh, about that. And we uh, will tomorrow. Absolutely. And, and also the um, uh, it's the anniversary of uh, Gemini 9A. And Gemini 9A is, uh, I'm sure, interesting to Buzz Aldrin, who you mentioned uh, previously when we were talking, uh, because the the problems that occurred uh, uh, prior to that, uh, with um, Elliot C. and uh, uh, and uh, Bassett being killed in a uh, uh, T-38 accident 
put Buzz Aldrin in a rotation as an astronaut that ended up with uh, contributing to his being these in the uh, cap or in the uh, lander with Neil Armstrong. And, Never thought about and, that. That tragic. The, the prime crew, uh, Elliot C. and and Charlie Bassett, were flying into St. Louis, uh, right, Mc, McDonald factory where there was a landing strip for the airplanes they were building there, and they crashed into a building. Uh, and behind them were their backups, uh, Gene uh, uh, Cernan, and uh, piloting was the general, Tom Stafford. And they saw the crash and saw their mates killed, and uh, they, be they became the, the new crew there. And uh, I never thought about that, that that probably helped Lovell, too, because they, uh, yes. they, they, they were Gemini 12 pilots, Lovell and... Uh, uh, Buzz Aldrin. So, yeah, that's interesting. Yeah, we'll talk some about that tomorrow. We love talking about Ed White any chance okay. we can. Yes, we want to say hi friend. to a few people watching. Stay curious, Hugh. We've got Robert Law in Scotland enjoying oh, a nice okay. evening, uh, spring evening there in, in Dundee, Scotland. Gary Gerald's watching. Uh, Bartlex uh, from the UK. <laughs> we got Christopher Mick as a, a STEAM educator in Hudson, Wisconsin. Uh, Ishmael Ramal, thank you for watching. Carol Kavanaugh, uh, Adrian Padrick, and Ant Anthony Ver Veradana is watching. And uh, along with Mark Fontaine, thank you for watching. And we've got our regulars, of course, Tom UCX watching. Hi, Tom. Hi, Tom. And, uh, and his brother Mark is watching. Mark's going to be here next week, and we'll have him on Stay Curious. And Carlton Bailey was just in the museum being interviewed by a young lady from Australia about stuff. Ophelia. Hi, Ophelia. She's in Normandy, <laughs> France, enjoying her evening there. And uh, so we, we appreciate everybody staying curious with us. Dave Stangy and uh, Larry Pushkar are, are, are two uh, Michiganders that love to watch mm -hmm. us. And uh, you know where Lorraine, Ohio is? Oh, absolutely. Yeah. And Pamela Shivett grew up there. She mm -hmm. watches and she's an associate and uh, uh, a, a lunar and planetary observer mm -hmm. with the Association of Lunar and Planetary Observers. Hey, Pam, glad that you're watching. She is from uh, Lorraine Admiral King High School there, that were our foes from uh, uh, Finley. Really? Grew up. Yeah. Oh, yeah. They were in our same conference. <laughs> yeah. So. So we appreciate everybody watching us on uh, YouTube and, and uh, Facebook and tell people to like, share, subscribe, and follow us as our following grows and people are finding that our Stay Curious podcast uh, has a lot to offer, including this legend, Mr. Hugh Harris. So uh, uh, thank you for wanting to be part of this, Hugh, and I know that you enjoy it. What else did you bring us today about the shuttles of June. Well, I, there's a, a, a lot to be said about some of the missions. Uh, STS-40, uh, which was a Colombian mission, uh, is a, a good example of several things that happen. Uh, but the one of them is that shuttles didn't always go when they were scheduled, <laughs> as you know. And uh, in that particular case, uh, Columbia uh, was originally scheduled for May 22nd, and uh, but it had a, a leaky liquid hydrogen transducer, and it ended up uh, uh, having to have that changed along with some liquid oxygen transducer, uh, which uh, the engineers thought might break and be injected into the turbo pumps, thus destroying the uh, whole shuttle at liftoff. Mm. So. Uh, uh, it got off to a good start by waiting until June, uh, which took it a couple of uh, uh, more weeks. STS-40 also had three women on board, well, Jernigan, Seddon, and Hughes Fulford. Well, the other thing it had uh, is that was really the first mission that was solely dedicated to science uh, using the uh, habitable uh, module. Okay. And it had 30 rodents, uh, thousands of jellyfish, <laughs> and 10 humans to do experiments on. 
And the, uh, the studies were, there were uh, studies of six body systems, um, uh, lung and uh, uh, blood vessels, muscles and bones, brains and nerves, white blood cells. Uh, and um, the, uh, it, it's a good example of uh, some of the things that have been going on as far as science is concerned that people don't realize. And people think, well, people are out there exploring space, but they're really exploring human beings and other beings and the habitability of the earth. And um, the, there was, uh, uh, th that was just, uh, you know, one of the, uh, the flights, but uh, actually, it, uh, it turns out there's probably been a hundred flights that have done research uh, that is valuable in the uh, the medical uh, area and things you don't think about. Um, uh, prior to um, uh, the space program, uh, the uh, there was uh, uh, they didn't have as clean a uh, atmosphere. Go ahead, get your yes, spam so phone call in. Sorry you, about that's that. That's all right. Take care of that, sir. You're well, good. I don't want to get the phone call <laughs> because you're right. It says <laughs> spam danger. These something. missions were the bedrock of what's going on right now at the International Space that's Station. Right. And that, what, uh, what I was going to mention is that uh, the ability of uh, setting up the process of making sure that uh, experiments uh, were uh, completely sterile uh, was a technology that was transferred to hospitals so that the uh, hospital operating rooms uh, used technology that was developed in the very early days of the space program. And sometime uh, we need really to talk about uh, uh, spinoffs, uh, but spinoffs uh, is a uh, sort of a misnomer in some ways, because although they occur all of the time, uh, the direct uh, uh, object of uh, uh, investigations and experiments um, are aimed at a great deal of what happens here on Earth, uh, ranging from the ball bearing or the uh, roller bearings and ball bearings that are in your car mm -hmm. uh, to uh, uh, things that in in everyday life, uh, anywhere you go, uh, there is a, a contribution from the space program. There certainly is. You just got a phone call proving that kind of contribution because that phone call probably went through some satellites <laughs> and some transponders and and, and cell towers and so forth, and that would be a great show. Spin well, off and, one and day. Uh, you know, one has to wonder whether they were all great uh, contributions because <laughs> people get so many phone calls that are <laughs> annoying today. There's got to be uh, some way to uh, trim that off somehow. Well, they say there's an app for that, but then that app's got advertising and stuff on there, so... Shoals of June with Mr. Hugh Harris, known as the voice of NASA, talking to millions of people every shuttle launch. Uh, not the only one to do that, like he said. He wanted to rotate people out. You, uh, uh, you were promoted by the uh, uh, Center Kennedy Space Center Director Bob Crippen, uh, and and uh, I believe you spent your last six years as the manager of the per, uh, Public Affairs Office right. and. Uh, but you, you you dealt another 20 years as the assistant and doing all kinds of other things. So. Well, one, one thing that uh, is sort of interesting uh, is that uh, Bob Crippen was a great fan of Sally Ride. Mm -hmm. um, uh, and um, Commander of her second flight, by the way. Well, and uh, he sort of insisted uh, uh, that uh, she be there because of her capabilities with the... Uh, uh, Canada arm mm -hmm. and uh, uh, in, and I can't remember now the, exactly what she did but the um, in one case there were two things on uh, on that flight 
where uh, something was not working. In one of them, she used the Canada arm to shake it, uh, which had never been done before mm. and had never been trained for. And in the other, uh, she used it to nudge a, uh, a seal back into place, mm. which if it had not had been done, would have made it impossible really to uh, re-enter the atmosphere. Interested, did not know that, but very important. The, the techniques with these Canada arms uh, is a, an intense training all of its own, isn't it, Hugh? Oh, absolutely. Yeah, it's just and, it's not like a game uh, joystick type of thing. There's, there's no, a lot to it, I understand. But, but it doesn't hurt to learn how to do that sort of thing. <laughs> right. Uh, the astronauts need those kinds of skills. What else do you have for us, our shuttles of June? Well, the um, I was uh, one of the um, ones I was trying to think of. Oh, on um, STS-117, uh, which was an Atlantis. Uh, and that was a uh, one of the things that you could call curious. Uh, because when it was sitting on the pad, we had a huge hailstorm. Oh. with hail uh, the size of golf balls, uh, which punched uh, um, uh, 1,200 divots into the uh, foam that was covering the, uh, the tank. Mm -hmm. And um, I, what ended up with being the longest mission uh, had to uh, be delayed because that all had to be repaired and uh, before that happened. But um, it was a long it, launched on the 8th and landed on the 22nd. So, yes, uh, and, a long two week mission there. So, but there we'll was have a triple T if he knows anything about that hailstorm. Well, well uh, he does. On the I, pad. I guarantee anybody who was around knew about the hailstorm. Because you saw it on, did, were you there when the storm happened? Well, yeah, well I, not, I don't think I was actually there when it was happening. I think it happened at night, mm -hmm. but I'm not. Uh, positive, but we certainly found out as soon as we got back to work. Hmm. Um, one of the things that also uh, uh, had to be done on that flight, uh, it turned out that a picture that was taken um, of, the, uh, of the launch revealed that there was a gap in the uh, thermal blankets on one of the OMS pods, the orbital maneuvering hmm. uh, pods. The little pumps and, on the back of the shuttle. Right. And um, that, again, would be a danger for the, that uh, particular maneuvering engine, uh, you know, to be damaged on reentry. And um, that had to uh, be repaired on, on orbit. So that was one of the... Uh, first repairs that I remember of, of that sort. But uh, what also was curious, which fits in with your mm -hmm. name, uh, it carried a 400-year-old artifact, uh, which was a metal cargo tag uh, that was etched with the name of its destination, which was spelled Y-A-M-E-S, but actually it meant Jamestown, and mm. uh, it was wow. uh, it was sent on uh, uh, supplies that were being sent from England uh, to Jamestown uh, uh, 400 years before huh. uh, to mark where the cargo was going. Um, and I don't know whether they ever spelled Jamestown with a Y <laughs> here. <laughs> but they did in my history books. One of the first settlements. And, anyway, yeah. uh, it was unearthed uh, uh, just in uh, 2006, and uh, it was taken up um, uh, on that flight with uh, uh, some other uh, coins that uh, recognized early American explorers. Hmm. All kinds of things go up in space, don't they? That's yeah. right. Not just vodka. <laughs> Not just vodka. Okay. Uh, uh, I'll point out a couple things that I don't know if you have on your yeah. list, but the month of June, you see there STS-91 begins the month 
with a launch on June 2nd. That is the last mission to the Mir space station. And we end the month, Hugh, with STS-71 when Atlantis in 92 went to the first docking of the uh, Mir space mm -hmm. station. That's right. Uh, and what do you remember about the cooperation with the Russians during this three-year period of a very, a lot of negotiations, uh, and then they taught us a lot about space station living? Well, well, they did. And um, as a matter of fact, we talked a little bit about uh, the mirror before, but um, the mirror and uh, uh, the Chinese space station, for instance, and uh, the various modules on the International Space Station are probably good precursors to the top of space state or the type of space stations we're going to have in the past or in the future. Mm -hmm. The uh, what made the space station as we know it today, which is a, a huge uh, structure in space, possible was the space shuttle because you had to have some kind of truck to take all this stuff up there. Mm -hmm. And uh, we don't have that anymore. And I don't know whether uh, we ever will do that again. But the, uh, the, uh, the Mir, for instance, uh, was not built as a space station uh, with uh, uh, that sort of... Uh, uh, capability by the Russians. But what, what I remember the most about um, cooperation at that time was that was uh, uh, during the Cold War, basically. And um, that was one bright spot in the Cold War where the two countries, the, especially the people, and it's always the, about people, uh, you know, work together, exchanged information, exchanged uh, ways of doing things, and uh, as though there was no problem anywhere else in the politics of the world. And um, so I think that the uh, whole space program uh, is a unifying uh, uh, force uh, in the world and probably has done as much as anything uh, to bring countries together rather than have them uh, pushed apart. Well said, Hugh, as we have orbiting our Earth right now, three Russians, three Americans, and an Italian woman on the Expedition mm -hmm. 67. Yeah. 67 different crews have trained to live on uh, six uh, to five to six month stints in space continuously for the last 22 years just uh what do you think about that when when it's put in that context oh well it's, it's exactly what i was uh you know trying to say before mm -hmm. is the uh uh it's a, it's a way of uh i i think if if there is any reason for people to be on earth the it's to uh make it better than they found it uh, and to uh, uh, create uh, a better future for the people who come after us. So I, I think that the uh, space program is a great part of doing that sort of thing. Excellent. Yeah. Uh, beautifully said again, Hugh. Uh, what else were you going to add to today's Stay Curious program? Uh, well, we could talk about uh, all of the various um, things. The, um, of course, the, we already mentioned the uh, uh, some of the uh, <clears throat> excuse me the uh, uh, first like uh, the uh, spacewalk of uh, of Ed White mm -hmm. and um, the. You know, the that had already uh, been accomplished by the Russians, for instance. But the um, uh, but people really didn't know uh, yet uh, at that point. You know how they could actually operate and work in space because there's a lot of complications uh, from the uh, uh, from the lack of the gravity 
and also from uh, uh, having to design new tools. Mm -hmm. And that gave us a, a start on designing the tools that allow us to, uh, to work without, uh, if you're trying to uh, work on a bolt or something, uh, instead of turning yourself, actually turning the bolt. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and we're going to talk more about spacewalks as we get into Gemini 9 tomorrow and in the, the, the some next week. Um, well, one, one thing might I want to, uh, uh, STS-51G, mm -hmm. uh, which was launched on this, uh, June 17th, uh, was a good um, uh, step in the international area. That's, uh, that crew included uh, Prince uh, Sultan bin Salman Al Said of Saudi Arabia, and he was the uh, first uh, Arab, the first Muslim, and the first member of a royal family to uh, fly in space. And it was also the, uh, uh, the first shuttle to fly without an astronaut from the pre-shuttle era. Uh, Is that right? 51G launched in 1985. Yeah. Uh, let's see our shuttles of the the month there. It's uh, uh, 51G is uh, there the uh, the last one in the upper right, right, right hand corner there. Uh, yes, yeah, Sultan uh, uh, Sultan Al Saud. And uh, bet he took some swag with him up to space and bring it back. I, I'm not real sure, but the uh, it also carried though the uh, second French citizen to go into space. And um, one of the things which maybe some of your stay curious uh, uh, listeners knows, uh, one of the uh, wake up songs and. Uh, for those of you who don't know about wake-up songs, uh, it wasn't until the Gemini series where people spent, uh, uh, had regular uh, uh, nights when they slept. They weren't really nights because it changed every 90 minutes. Mm -hmm. But the, uh, in, in any case, uh, the, uh, they instituted uh, having wake-up songs to wake them up at the right time. And those songs were picked uh, either by the astronauts themselves or by the families primarily. And that's the only time that I know of that one of the wake up songs was the wedding march. Hmm. And you play the piano? No, I just hum. <laughs> yeah. I just hum. I, anyway. Uh, I meant to try and find, you know, wh who was the astronaut yeah. uh, or family who asked for that. It had to be somebody who had. What just mission was there. that, Hugh? Uh, that was uh, 51G again. Okay, the wake up song. Mm -hmm. and, and almost as curious, not quite, uh, one of the uh, wake up songs on that one was Jonathan Livington Seagull by Neil Diamond. Okay. And it'd be sort of interesting uh, to know how they got picked and by which astronaut. And I think you have a question that's uh, coming in. Okay, Marty? Yeah, Carl Bailey wants to know, was uh, Greg Jarvis originally scheduled for 51G? Was Greg Jarvis originally scheduled for 51G from Carlton Bailey? Thank you, Carlton. Uh, uh, Hugh, what's your answer? I have no idea. Well, 1985, <laughs> yeah. and I believe he's right. I think Jarvis mm -hmm. got bumped from uh, maybe two shuttle missions. He was a Hughes astronaut, basically, right. uh, flying with the Hughes uh, satellites, uh, as this is what the space truck was going to be, was uh, forget your single stick rockets. Everybody's going to want to use the shuttle to mm -hmm. pick their satellites up. So... These space companies had astronauts trained to go up there and troubleshoot those, and, well, and Jarvis right. was one of them. Mm -hmm. And I think fate did deal him a, a, a bad hand that he got bumped from two missions there, Carlton, is what, what I've read. And learning so much and so many new things you never thought about from Mr. Hugh Harris, who spent his life working for 
NASA and its wonderful space program promoting uh, to the public, uh, taking this complex uh, rocket science stuff so that everyone can understand it. We I call it Joe and Jane America out there. Uh, <laughs> owe you a great debt for making uh, things uh, simple there, uh, Hugh. What else do you have to add today on our Stay Curious program? Well, yeah. the uh, I have notes on all of the flights, but I don't think you want to get into uh, all of the things that happened. Well, we had two shuttles launched on the same day. The fifth, we have STS-40 and three ACEs. One, 111 was launched right. on the fifth. And then on the 27th of the month, we have a very important mission. Maybe you'll comment about STS-4, the last time America flew two astronauts and two only in space was STS-4 on uh, June 27th, 1982. And of course, that was uh, Ken Mattingly in uh, Hartsfeld. I find that interesting. The last time maybe we'll ever fly just two people in space, you. Uh, uh, STS-4? Yeah, 4. Yeah, uh, which is one of my favorite uh, emblems there, right in the middle and the bottom, the oval of Columbia. I've, I've always liked that that look of that uh, patch there. And uh, as you're looking at that, we had of the 11 missions flown in June, three deployed satellites, mm -hmm. two went to the Mir Space Station, two were International Space Station hard hat missions, and four did pioneering work with laboratories. Well, it, and it also was the, the last of the uh, uh, test flights uh, for the shuttle, and that's why there were only two astronauts. Mm -hmm. Right. Uh, and uh, after that, it was declared uh, to be operational. And um, the, um, let's see, well, the, the uh, of course, Ken, Ken Mattingly flew to right. the moon on Apollo 10, and he was the commander of this mission. And uh, he was also the original command module pilot for Apollo 13. Yes, uh, he was. But uh, he was replaced by his backup. And um, the, um, in, in any case, the... Um, Weiger uh, was the backup there. Right. But uh, from then on, uh, uh, NASA halted the appointment and training of complete backup crews. Uh, having decided that uh, it was now operational and that uh, it wouldn't be necessary uh, to change the whole crew uh, uh, at one time uh, so they could replace individuals. Uh, but there was another um, uh, thing. Uh, one of the uh, uh, support crew on uh, that was Roy Bridges, who later became the... Uh, uh, center director mm -hmm. at uh, KSC, but um, he flew. But the but that launch STS four was the first time the space shuttle launched precisely uh, on its scheduled launch time. Mm -hmm. uh, it was okay. also the la well the, the, we mentioned last research and development flight, and uh, after that flight uh, the. Uh, uh, the ejection seats in the shuttle uh, were taken out and no longer fl uh, flown. And, uh, of course, that was brought into question uh, when we had the, uh, the Challenger accident. And there were other uh, uh, things uh, that were implemented, including uh, a pole, uh, which allowed an astronaut to go out and slide down a pole so that they missed being hit by the uh, uh, the rear part of the uh, of the space shuttle. But um, the other thing they <coughs> had um, was uh, it was the first getaway specials, and uh, uh, which were called gas cans. Mm -hmm. And uh, I think that was a great program. In the payload uh, bay, they had this uh, a, a pallet that had getaway specials that right. if you had an experiment and the money, you could put it on there, right? Well, no. Uh, well, yeah, uh, I don't know about the money part. 
uh, because uh, except for building the experiment, because most of them were educational ones that were provided by uh, uh, students in universities uh, across the country. Although there were uh, 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 commercial enterprises, mm -hmm. I think that also uh, could have them. So I don't know what the um, uh, that part of it uh, was, but in any case, um, the uh, there was a classified Air Force um, uh, experiment on board that one, um, which was a, a two missile launch detection system. And by the way, I didn't mention uh, before about Sally Ride, mm -hmm. but one of the contributions uh, that she made was that uh, after she left NASA, I think it was, uh, that she worked on uh, a system that allowed um, our country, and I imagine other countries, uh, to uh, remotely from space determine where atomic or nuclear warheads were and to count them and, uh, and know about their whereabouts. Now that uh, did not become necessary after uh, some of the, the last agreements where uh, inspection was uh, approved uh, in, in all the countries about uh, hmm. of nuclear warheads, but uh, it was uh, sort of interesting uh, that uh, she had worked on that. The other thing I didn't mention about Sally was that twice she was offered uh, the uh, to uh, to become the administrator of NASA. Really, and um, she also uh, was a uh, uh, a supporter of President Obama. And uh, she got the, um, uh, I've forgotten the, uh, the name of the award, uh, but the Presidential uh, Medal of Honor. Uh, Congressional Honor. Medal of Honor, yeah. It, may, it, may, it might have been yeah. the Congressional. So she actually was offered the NASA Administrator job, you say, twice. Twice. And why did she not want to take it, do you know? Well, I never asked her, but <laughs> because I wasn't that close to her. Uh -huh. uh, but... Um, I I suspect that uh, it might have been she, you know, would rather think about science than paperwork, and, <laughs> yeah. and, and politics and politics. Yeah, and there's a lot of politics uh, uh, involved in being the uh, uh, the administrator of NASA. Well, and that's Bill Nelson, a Florida uh, politician, and flew to space uh, in January of 1986 uh as an observer mm -hmm. and to his credit he considers himself a space passenger not an astronaut uh i've heard bill Mel nelson say that several times well he also did useful work uh, while he was up there actually a lot of the astronauts uh and uh, uh were really guinea pigs uh, for uh medical experiments Mm hmm Absolutely. Sure they were to find out what was going on there. Marty, you're writing down another note there. We're about to end our conversation she, with Mr. Hugh Harris. Yeah, she wouldn't have received the Congressional Medal of Honor. That's military. She probably received the Presidential Freedom oh, Award. Presidential yeah. Freedom yeah. Award. Yeah. Okay. Thank you, Marty, for clearing that up. Congressional Medal of Honor is military. And yes, the civilian is the Presidential Freedom Medal, I believe. It uh, is quite an honor to get. Uh, uh, well, Hugh, thank you so much for, I learned a lot. I hope you all stayed curious with some of the things that uh, Mr. Hugh Harris has shared with us from his illustrious career. And uh, it's kind of fun to look back on this, isn't it, sir? It is, but I rather look forward. Uh, <laughs> all right. You'd rather look forward? Well, let's get a forward program together <laughs> okay. one day on there. Uh, we all look forward to, to seeing you again and stay curious how about that okay and we also i also look forward to helping develop some of these uh, characters of the journalism world that you dealt with and uh, well they're wonderful people and uh, uh there's many of uh that have helped nasa uh with uh 
getting programs okayed by Congress uh, and also understood uh, and uh, applauded by the public. Absolutely, absolutely. We, we look forward to sharing some of those personalities with you down the road here. Uh, Marty, thank you for a wonderful job doing our Streamlabs programming today. And we are so grateful to our, our board of directors and Karen Conklin, our executive director, for wanting Stay Curious to be, come even stronger by giving us our own, own, our own facility. Like Hugh said at the beginning, we now occupy what was once the Hubble Gallery. Uh, right beside our Apollo Gallery and next door is the Gemini Mercury Galleries. Uh, so we hope to bring you more good programming, more things to help you stay curious. And let us know things that you want to want to hear more of. We, we entertain those thoughts either uh, on comments here or you can always get a hold of me, M-A-R-Q at americanspacemuseum.org. Thank you, Mr. Hugh Harris. You're always a gentleman and uh, around uh, us here at the museum. We're happy to see you all the time. We're going to have to bring you back more than once a month, it looks like, uh, to keep our shows under an hour, but it's always <laughs> a lot of fun talking to you, and we appreciate uh, your support of our humble nonprofit here. And uh, you can support us uh, any way you want. By the way, Hugh, I will mention that we have got a A+. Plus, uh, we got as far as you wanting to give money to charity and American Space Museum, you can give with confidence as we got a 95 out of 100 rating from something called Charity Navigator, mm -hmm. your guide to intelligent giving. So can't beat that, can you? No, you can't. Well, thanks again to Mr. Hugh Harris and Marty Winkle and everybody that supports our Stay Curious program. We'll be back tomorrow with Tales from the White Room with the one and only Triple T. Until then, I'm Mark Marquette saying we'll see you again to bridge the space between us.